I've already given the command. Just Good afternoon, everyone. The Department of Political Science welcomes you all on this webinar on citizenship and debates in contemporary India. I would like to call upon Aniket Pandey to please give the welcome speech. A very warm welcome to everyone present over here. I, Aniket Pandey, feel privileged to open this event and speak here. A very special welcome to our speaker, Professor Anupama Roy, Department of Political Science, Jawaharlal Nehru University. She truly sets a benchmark for her multi-hyphenated achievements. Thank you, ma'am, for accepting our invitation to address our students who are about to start another new chapter in their life. I'm also grateful to welcome our teachers, seniors, and students to this webinar on the topic Citizenship and Debates in Contemporary World. Finally, I'd like to wish everyone a good time at this webinar, and I wish you all to take some information with you. Thank you. I would request uh, Arnav to please come up on the screen. No, no, no. Uh, thank you, Aniket. I would now like to invite Dr. Indrajit Singh, HOD of our department, to please say a few words. Thank you, uh, Vedit, for this opportunity. And uh, it's, it's a great opportunity that we have with us, uh, Professor Anfama Roy, who has written a very, very hot button issue uh, she has written two or three books on this, uh, special, especially very, very hot and debatable discourse going on in the uh, country and not in the country, but all over the world. Citizenship has become so important that everybody is talking about uh, the debates concerning citizenship whose citizenship and if all the citizens uh, all, all citizens are equal in liberal democratic system whether they are equal or there is hierarchy uh, some citizens are excluded some are not as Partha Chatterjee has put it in his book politics of the government uh, political society then marginalized group then Upendra Bakshi has also talked about excluded citizenship and apart from that Hopman and T. H. Marshall I have talked about citizenship so odyssey of citizenship though it is very long right from the ancient Greek time but in the modern time its nature has changed and that's why there is a hot debate about citizenship that who should be Indian citizen we are talking about. We have been talking about different acts, Act of 55, then Act 2003, then Ordinance 2015. So it has created a lot of talk in the country and controversies also. So it is a great opportunity. Again, I just want to say that we have with us uh, the person who specializes in this uh, specific subject. So uh, we are really privileged, ma'am, to have you here. And I also welcome and I think uh, all the people here will be enlightened by your thoughts. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I now invite Arnav to please present Professor Anupama Roy's bio. Thank you, ma'am. Okay. Nelson Mandela has once said, which I quote, education is the most powerful weapon which you can use to change the world. It is so relevant in today's scenario. 
Following similar ideology in the field of academics, we have the immense pleasure of having with us Ms. Anupama Roy, our guest speaker for today, to talk on the subject citizenship and debates in contemporary India. Ms. Anupama Roy is a professor at the Center for Political Studies in Jawaharlal Nehru University. Her research focuses on debates on citizenship, political anthropology of public institutions, constitu constitutionalism, law and democracy, and gender studies. She obtained her master's from the Allahabad University, MPhil from the University of Delhi, and PhD degree from the State University of New York at Binghamton, USA. She is the author of Citizenship in India, Mapping Citizenship in India, Gendered Citizenship, Historical and Conceptual Exploration. Her forthcoming book, Citizenship Regime, Law and Belonging, examines the contemporary landscape of citizenship in India. Her research articles have appeared in various national and international journals, including Asian Studies Review, Australian Feminist Studies, Critical Asian Studies, Contribution to Indian so Sociology, Economic and Political Weekly Seminar, Election Law Journal, and Studies in Indian Politics. She is also the co-author of the book Election Commission of India, Institutionalizing Democratic Uncertainties, Dimension of Constitutional Democracy, India and Germany, and Poverty, Gender and Migration to Women and Migration in Asia. She has been a visiting scholar in various universities, including Sydney University, University of Warwick, and University of Würzburg, Germany. Among many other achievements, she also achieved Sir Ratan Tata Postdoctoral Fellow at the Institute of Economic Growth in Delhi and KTP Fellow at University of Technology, Sydney, Australia. Wow, words seem less than action. Today, we have the honor of having her with us in this webinar. Ma'am, I, on the behalf of Sri Guru Nanak Dev Khalsa College, would like to thank you for your valuable time to us. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Um, I would now request respected Professor Anupama Roy to please uh, come on the mic. Sir, I think I can't see her in the call. Maybe there is some network issue. She is not in the network. Yes, she has just joined the okay. Uh, there seems to be an issue, a connectivity issue at my end. Uh, so I lost connection momentarily. Uh... Okay, no problem, ma'am. I hand over the mic to you now. Uh, can can you hear me now? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am, we can hear you. All right. Uh, I I have a, I have Indrajit's phone number. So in case uh, there is a connection issue, I'll get in touch with him. Uh, uh, but please, Indrajit, pick up the phone and I call you. So I'm I I couldn't hear uh, for a while. So I'm assuming that I've been asked to speak, um, and I will I will start now. Uh, shall I do that? Yes, ma'am. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so thank you very much for the generous invitation uh, Khalsa College Political Science Department has extended to me and also for a very gracious introduction. And I, I do hope, as uh, Indrajit said, uh, you know, in this uh, cold of Delhi, uh, this topic is going to uh, lead to some discussions you know, which, would be, um, uh, which would animate us all. I, I don't want to uh, present that as some kind of a, a debate which could lead to acrimony, but something that could provoke and uh, provoke a discussion you know, rather than an argument. So in that spirit, you know, let me uh, outline uh, some of the debates on citizenship, uh, particularly in the context of India. 
uh, and uh, broadly, uh, I would be focusing on uh, three sites of debates uh, and would be uh, focusing on, since the topic is about contemporary India, uh, on the period uh, 2014 onwards. Uh, and of course, the uh, lineages to this period lies, as uh, Indrajit said, in the history of uh, citizenship in India. And I would be focusing largely on the on the legal frameworks, uh, but I would be drawing on uh, the debates that have accumulated you know, along the fault lines that the legal uh, frameworks of citizenship have thrown up. Uh, as, as, as Indrajit mentioned earlier, uh, there are different ways in which citizenship is understood. And one of the most prevalent way, and in some senses, uh, the dominant way of understanding citizenship is to look at it in terms of uh, full and equal membership in the political community, you know, which is a definition that has been attributed to T.H. Marshall. Although you know, those of us who are familiar with T.H. Marshall's writing uh, would be aware that uh, that is a definition that has been derived you no know, rather than explicitly present you know, in uh, in Marshall's writing. Uh, but it is also a definition that has legal recognition recognition in different you no know, court uh, judgments and uh, I'm sorry. Uh, so uh, this is this is you no know, where we begin from you know, what is citizenship? If citizenship is about full and equal membership in the political community, you know, what is it about you know, uh, the character of citizenship uh, that, uh, that you know, gives it the uh, attribute of uh, fullness and equality? So uh, if, if one maps the contours of the debate, uh, one side of the debate that I would be talking about is the uh, the, the fault line between uh, what one could say constitutionalism and democracy and the power of the state. You know? So if, if these three categories could in some ways uh, be uh, put in a relationship of, uh, uh, of, of uh, dissonance. You know? so, so talk about constitutionalism and democracy and the state as an overwhelming power, you no, know, which which would which could possibly, in some senses, have the potential of submerging uh, uh, constitutionalism and democracy. A second side of the debate is uh, what one could perhaps call the uh, the fault line over, you know, how we understand the uh, the idea of belonging itself. You know? So, uh, how do we what what are the ways in which one can become citizens? Uh, is it because we are born on a, a particular soil and therefore you know, we could talk about belonging uh, through our relationship to uh, the state and its jurisdiction? Or is there something else that determines our belongingness? And you know, is that, what is that something else? You no, know, is it the relationship that you know, we have with each other you know, and in, in terms of uh, 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 a relationship of blood, which would then determine our belonging. So in, 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 the, uh, in the manner in which citizenship is understood along these two different uh, 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 ways of belonging is use soli and use sanguinous. So, so, so where and how do these two different ways of belonging uh, acquire precedence? So that would be the second site of debate in the Indian context. And the third site of debate, which is perhaps uh, most familiar to us because you know, we've been following the, and all of us, I'm assuming, have been following the debates uh, in the parliament and public, uh, in the public, in, in, in media, on, 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 on the way in which the present of the citizenship, the you know, present of citizenship relates to its past. You know? So if, if one uh, goes to the uh, Lok Sabha debates, the archives of, uh, of, of the period, 
December 2019 uh, and January 2019, uh, when the Citizenship Act was first discussed, and then the Citizenship Act was discussed a second time uh, in 2019, uh, following the uh, following the second coming of the BJP government. Uh, how in the Parliament debates, uh, the the idea of citizenship was resurrected in ways that remained subterranean or remained uh, uh, were, 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 uh, were subsumed by a different understanding of, of citizenship. And, and the past that I'm referring to here is the debates in the Constituent Assembly. So these are the three sites that you know, I, would be, I would be touching upon. And because of the constraints of time, I would be touching upon them briefly uh, but these are important sites, and we need to know what, why, why these are important. And then in the question-answer session, we could have a detailed discussion on perhaps each of these sites. Uh, the first site, and, and in order to explicate the fault line of the debate you know, on the site of uh, the relationship between constitutionalism, democracy, and the state, you know, I would very briefly take us back to uh, to, to, to 2019. Uh, and and, and this, is, this is not India. This is another site that I'm talking about. Uh, it's, it's, the, it's the streets of Moscow. And there is, in June 2019, a protest being waged in the streets of Moscow against the deferral of the participation of opposition in the Moscow Duma elections. And and among the protesters is this uh, young schoolgirl, Olga Misik, and she is sitting cross-legged in front of, uh, of, of the riot geared Mos Russian pol Moscow police, and she's reading out the constitution to them. And, and, you know, and, and at times, you know, she moves up to the policeman and points out specific places in the text of the constitution where she points out and says, no, this is where you're wrong. No, what you're doing is illegal. And, uh, and, and this is the, these images of uh, Olga Misik became almost as iconic at that point in time as perhaps the figure of the lone man in 1989 Tiananmen Square, you know, standing in front of a line of tanks and, 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 and a space by so many years, you know, the, the idea that there could be a lone person who could stand up and against authority and show them something as innocuous as the text of a constitution. So, so, so the, the, and of course, Olga, Olga Misik is picked up by the police later and not from the site of protest, no, where, no, in front of the camera and, and media, but uh, no, it, it, she's, she's picked up at the subway where there's perhaps no one, very few people to witness that. And, and Misik said, to, tells later, uh, media persons that uh, no, she didn't think that anybody else apart from the policeman would be able to hear her. And and of course we know that uh, these images, uh, in an unconnected way, you no, know, resonated in the streets in Delhi, you no, know, through December to uh, March 2019 when the pan pandemic folded up the, the protests against the CAA, uh, folded them up and into the virtual space, sometimes uh, effectively, but often uh, uh, to often diminishing the, 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 the protests. But what was important in this context is the way in which the claim to the constitution was being made by the people in, in what can be construed as a moment of heightened consciousness about citizenship, a consciousness that was permeating the people. And it's interesting at this point in time, uh, the, the, the text of the constitution, particularly the Hindi translation of the constitution, which was you know, being sold on Amazon in the category of law and politics became a bestseller. So, so there is a way in which physical copies of the constitution were being lobbed in the streets as a mark of protest against what a lot of people thought was an, an unfair law. And, 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 and as in the case of Olga Misik, we see also in the case in India, uh, a lot of uh, the state overwhelms the space of the public. And uh, there are cases instituted against uh, anti-CA protesters. And, and, and if, if one looks at the, some of the facts which have been 
uh, put uh, put in the public domain by Article 14, uh, at least um, in 26 cases, almost 4,000 ca uh, 4, persons were brought under the purview of an act so serious as sedition. So, so there is this one side of debate that I want to point towards, which is a, a site of contestation between constitutionalism and democracy, uh, no, and, and, and the way in which the state, which needs to be bound by constitutional morality, is overwhelming that space of democracy. So uh, that is one side. The second side of contestation is, is the, the fault line that has emerged between two ways of understanding citizenship. Now, now in, in, the, in the first side of debate, there was this, uh, the idea of uh, you know, what is it or how is it that the state relates with the people you know? and, and particularly uh, through the institution of citizenship. So if, if one, one sees the state as an institution that disburses citizenship in terms of a legal status, you know, that who, who is it that would decide that a person is a citizen or not? No, that power of dispersal and uh, that power of uh, determining citizenship lies with the state. And people like Rogers Brubaker, who have you know, worked on, uh, on, on, on comparative frameworks of citizenship uh, as, and, and, and two models of citizenship in, in, the, in the European context, would say that you no know, citizenship is an institution which allows the modern state to constitute and reconstitute itself continually. And the way it does it is, to, is through uh, uh, the instrumentalities of closure. No? And closure externally by uh, identifying those who belong in this closed space of citizen citizenship and those who remain outside the space of citizenship. But also internally, it is the state that is disposing of citizenship, disbursing citizenship and not private individuals. So, so in, in, in this process of dispersal of citizenship, the state is also uh, edging out and making relativizing, you know, making, making irrelevant in some ways, uh, other organizations, associations that are also significant for people. So, so the state attempts to assume the status of primary identity. You know, for citizens, and and not just the primary identity, but the 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 most salient and politically relevant identity. So the membership in the state then becomes uh, 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 the 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 most salient feature of how uh, people identify themselves as as part of a political community. Now, in this in this context, there are two ways in which you know, people uh, people can belong. You know, and, and, and both these ways are uh, ways of, uh, uh, of, of, uh, of ascriptions or, or birthright citizenship. Uh, and, and if you come to think of it you know, uh, in all spheres of public life, uh, the, the idea of something that we can claim entitlement to by birth has been discredited. No? But uh, in, the, in the context of citizenship, but the idea that citizenship accrues to us, attaches to us through birth, no, remains the most dominant idea. So uh, being born in a particular territory, then in a, in, 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 in a particular tradition of thinking about citizenship, uh, becomes determining uh, uh, in, 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 in terms of uh, you know, what kind of allegiance we have to the state or to other citizens. So the what was in the feudal context, uh, a relationship of allegiance to political authority, where everybody who was born in the jurisdiction of the political authority would owe allegiance to it and the state would protect it. No? And, and in, in, in the modern context, this relationship of allegiance uh, transforms itself into a political relationship where the, the, the state would uh, 
you know, would through rights and obligations exercise jurisdiction over people and give them certain privileges and entitlements in terms of rights. But the idea is that everybody born in that territory, regardless of whether or not you know, your parents were part of that territory, would be, have claims to becoming citizens. And, and this is something that this idea of belonging is seen as something that is capacious, you know, which, which has possibilities of, uh, of, of, of making a political community, uh, uh, you know, giving solidarity to the political community, uh, because you would you know, have a, a people who would be, the number of people who are non-citizens would, uh, would be less in, in, in this kind of relationship between the state and citizens. The other way, of, however, is uh, the, the, the idea that citizenship can be inherited. You no know, citizenship can be passed on through blood from one generation to another. And, and this idea is associated with uh, the question of ancestry and legacy, but it also allows for the possibility of a particular political community to hold on to its diaspora elsewhere and also it holds out the promise of uh, you know, people returning to something which can be conceived as a homeland. So the idea of the homeland you know, where you are uh, can claim association with because of your ties of blood is something that is a prominent part of the just sanguinous, sanguinous framework of citizenship. Now, if one looks at the, uh, the, the development of uh, you know, citizenship in the Indian context, and Indrajit alluded to that, you know, there is a tendency in, in the citizenship law in India where the law is in very uh, assuredly uh, has moved from a, a, a location of use solely to use sanguinous. And, and this is seen in, 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 in particularly uh, through 1986, when the idea of citizenship by birth or the provisions of citizenship by birth in the uh, citizenship law of 1955 were changed to, uh, to put in uh, uh, the modified idea that uh, a person can be citizen by birth only if you know, one of uh, his or her parents was also an Indian citizen. So, so there is a gravitation towards youth sanguinous in 1986 itself, which all of you would recall is also the, the, the point uh, in which uh, Section 6A is put into the Citizenship Act to, to, to address the specific context of Assam. So in Assam, there is a graded system of citizenship that is put into place. But alongside, there is you know, a, a constraint on citizenship by birth that is put in law. Now, this becomes more emphatic in 2003. It becomes emphatic through the insertion of provisions in citizenship uh, by birth provisions where uh, you can be a citizen by birth only if both your parents are Indian citizens or one of them is an Indian citizen and the other is not an illegal migrant. Now, the, the, the category of illegal migrant here also becomes important because uh, this is the, for the first time that this category surfaces in the law on citizenship outside the provisions which pertain to Assam. So illegal citizen, citizenship in the provisions of birth, citizenship by birth, citizenship by registration, citizenship by naturalization, all uh, inserted into the law of citizenship. So there is the, the recognition in law that there is a category of illegal citizens, illegal migrants that you know, uh, the political community ought to be wary of. Uh, what we see in 2000, uh, the, the 2019 amendment in the Citizenship Act is, uh, which is, of course, the point of contention in the contemporary uh, moment uh, of the landscape of citizenship in India, is that the amendment places, inserts an exemption in this category of illegal migrants that was put into place by the 2003 amendment. So 2003 amendment uh, barred people who are illegal migrants for seeking any kind of citizenship. What the 2019 amendment does is that it exempts certain categories of people, not all, certain categories of people identified by their uh, you know, uh, origins in particular countries uh, and their uh, 
religion, which uh, is what I would call, uh, which leaves out uh, Muslims as a residual category and all other, uh, you no know, Hindus, Muslim, uh, Hindus, Sikhs, Christians, Buddhists, Jains, or Austrians, you no, know, all of them, if they come from specific countries, identified countries, you no, know, Pakistan, Bangladesh, and Afghanistan, uh, and they'd entered India before 31st December 2014, could uh, apply for citizenship by registration and you know, uh, obtain it. Uh, so the, the, the erasure of illegality for some a class of people is something that 2019 amendment puts in place at the same time. And this is also when the entire contest over uh, uh, enumeration of citizenship comes into uh, enumeration of citizens you know, becomes you know, a point of debate and contestation you know, in, in India. Uh, although the site is Assam, the debates encompass the, the entire country. Uh, and and if, if, you, if you recall the, the, the purpose of the NRC uh, and, and the origins of NRC, which lie in the 2003 amendment, uh, which required that uh, the, the, the central government, if it so wishes, can prepare a national register of citizens and uh, you know, and, and identifies the modalities through which that register that register could be prepared. It does not say it must compulsorily do it. No, it says no. If it can do it, but once it's it it's, it starts this process of preparation, it's something in which everybody need, would be required to participate compulsorily. So the 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 2019 rules put in place an exemption an exception for Assam. So whereas if there was a, a preparation, the preparation of National Register of Citizens in the rest of the country, uh, there would be you know, like a, 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 an enumeration by households uh, in the, in the, uh, and the, when the enumerators would be coming to each household. You know, in the context of Assam, you know, the, there needs to be an application done you know, uh, uh, following a required procedure, and much of that require much of the requirement you know, in 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 the context of Assam had to also uh, was an affirmation of something called legacy, and the legacy was the 1951 NRC in Assam plus the electoral rolls right up to 1971. So the innovation of this category of legacy, uh, which was you know, uh, which which is significant. Because what it does is it, it, it requires people to trace ancestry. So again, the documentary practice of citizenship uh, and the idea that state can actually uh, make a, create a wall of separation between citizens and non-citizens and documents can actually prove citizenship was something that the NRC put in place. The CAA was based on a different logic. No, it was a logic of uh, you know, providing protection to people who were you know, persecuted on the basis of religion. And this was done under the veneer of uh, liberal, uh, uh, liberal rights, you know, because you, know, you cannot have people who, 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 are, who, who become refugees and you know, are simultaneously also could have the a potential of becoming stateless. And what is required is that the state extends protection to them. So, so much of the discourse around CAA, you know, the, 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 uh, those who were uh, uh, proposing the CAA and uh, pushing it, uh, uh, defending it, were making this argument, the liberal argument of protection of rights of people who were discriminated on the basis of religion. So, so there was, were these two different logics on which the NRC and the CAA were based but both these logics came together and became conjoined in the 2015 plus context, right up to 2016. Remember the Assam uh, elections and uh, you know, the promises that the, the BJP was making uh, in, during that election uh, that it would make Assam uh, free from Bangladeshi infiltrators. And immediately after its victory after Assam, it introduced the CAA uh, in, in the Lok Sabha. And, and, and that was when the Lok Sabha, when the CA was introduced for the first time and the JPC was constituted 
to go into the details and recommend you know, whether and in what form the, the CA ought to be taken up in parliament. So these two different tendencies in law that were emerged, that emerged from 2003 amendment conjoined in the period 2015-16 onwards and became the dominant discourse leading to contestations over citizenship. What was CAA and you know, how the CAA was, uh, you know, what kind of a figuration of citizenship the CAA was presenting you know, within the uh, 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 frameworks of use sanguinis, in particular the idea that there is a homeland to which people could return where they could get uh, 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 get protection uh, and and therefore therefore an anxiety in a lot a lot of people that this figuration of citizenship in the ter in terms of a dominant identity which left out muslims is discriminatory and and therefore you no know, a split idea of, of what is home and what is homeland you know, became a point of anxiety and debate uh, there is at this point in the the nrc is still in a limbo you no know, you have a final draft of the nrc uh, you have you no know, final draft is you no know, an oxymoron if something is final it cannot be a draft but there is something called a final nrc but there are contestations over the nrc too but the principle behind nrc is something that i want us to look at is the 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 idea that you no know, that the the relationship between documents and citizens is you know, what is normally assumed to be you now i hold an, a voter id card because i'm a citizen now i have a passport because i'm a citizen i would be using these documents for different purposes i use the voter id card to be able to vote i use the passport to be to travel uh, uh, to to travel abroad uh, but none of these documents are uh, are actually documents that would identify or I would present as identifiers of my being an Indian citizen, but I hold these documents because I am an Indian citizen. Now, what the NRC was doing was it was reversing this relationship to say that you collect these documents, you accumulate these documents that, uh, that, that have been identified, of course, by the the NRC uh, uh, commission commissioner uh, and 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 those documents would together prove your citizenship. So this relationship is inverted in a way because you now if I have these documents, you no, know, I can prove that I'm a citizen. You now if I don't have these documents, you no, know, I cannot prove that I'm a citizen. But as a citizen, I am entitled. I was entitled to these documents, which for some reason I do not have. Now, and even in the context of Assam, documents that we assume, like the voter ID card, to be a document which would conclusively say that, yes, you are a citizen of the country, now, is not treated as a document which would be evidence of citizenship because it is then located in a different kind of logic where it needs to fit into the evidentiary framework of linkage documents. So, so there is a lot of complex uh, uh, complexity uh, around what a document means uh, in the NRC and and, 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 and and the convoluted process in Assam. Now, let me come to the third site. And I think I have about, uh, it's 4.41. So I have about uh, 10 to 15 minutes before you know, we break for a discussion. Uh, let me come to the to the third site of the debate. And, and this site is uh, the authoritative sites of uh, uh, lawmaking sites, the parliament, you know, and, uh, and, 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 and the debate in the parliament that happened in December uh, 2019. Uh, no, if, 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 if you look back at that, at, at that debate, uh, it appears you no, know, there, there are uh, three strands in that debate. And one strand is uh, those who were in favor of, of the CAA. Uh, the, those in favor of the CAA uh, were in favor of an idea of citizenship which they were presenting as a necessary corrective for a past wrong. So this, this, is, this, is, this was one of a moral justification 
for the amendment in, in, this, in the citizenship law. So it, it's necessary because there was something that happened in the past, which was no partition. And the partition uh, no put in place a uh, split split citizens and and therefore it's only uh, in, it's only uh, 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 morally justifiable that a law must be made to address that wrong. Uh, so the, the 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 idea that the law, law is necessary was part of 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 the of of that dominant discourse. Uh, the second component of this this discourse was. Uh, the 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 fact uh, that the parliament has lawmaking powers over citizenship. So uh, parliament can, of course, make laws over a huge range of, of of subjects, and the parliament is the primary lawmaking uh, body in the country, uh, and and it has the authority and the competence to make laws over citizenship. Uh, and 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 much of the arguments in the parliament over this lawmaking power was to uh, take recourse to Article 11 of the Constitution, you know, which says that you know, the the nothing in this part of the Constitution, which is you know, Article, uh, which is Chapter Two of the uh, Constitution, from Articles 5 to 11, which deal with citizenship provisions, nothing in this part of the constitution will, will arrogate from the powers of the parliament to make laws on matters of citizenship. So this Article 11, it's, it's placing its placement in chapter two of uh, citizenship provisions of the constitution and its text, which says that nothing would you know, bar the parliament from making laws, nothing that has been said in this part of article of, 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 of the constitution uh, would bar the parliament from making laws over citizenship. So this is what is presented in the parliament as unfettered powers to make laws over all matters of citizenship. And, and this is extended to uh, also an argument that uh, is, is reported back to what Ambedkar said in the Constituent Assembly. Uh, uh, about the difficulties that uh, the the assembly was facing uh, in making provisions uh, on citizenship because it was such a complex uh, 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 such a complex topic uh, to be legislating on given the context of partition and given the the the, the numerous kinds of people that would lay claims to citizenship in in the flux of 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 making borders in the flux of people moving across borders and in the situation where there was uh, uh, unprecedented violence uh, which was experienced by people you know, who were crossing borders and and therefore in that in that context you know, what is it that uh, how 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 was the constant assembly equipping itself to make law on something uh, that would give fixidity uh, in in this in this context of a uh, 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 fluidity and, uh, and 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 trauma. So so Ambedkar and others in in while uh, discussing and debating the citizenship provisions in the constitution, you know, in in the last reading uh, between tenth to twelfth uh, August, nineteen forty nine, are talking precisely about the complexity of, of, of legislating on citizenship. And, and when Ambedkar presented the, the draft provisions on citizenship, he presented it alongside what he called a veritable jungle of amendments, which were, in, which were proposed of, on those provisions. So there were 130 to 140 amendments that were simultaneously proposed alongside the uh, the, the 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 provisions that that were presented as a proposal by Ambedkar, and in that context, while you no know, while addressing those amendments, Ambedkar said that uh, you no know, what one must keep in mind is that you no know, the provisions that we are making at present are provisions that are not permanent. You know, they are ad hoc provisions which are intended to address the the, the contingencies of the present. So a future parliament would make laws 
that would you know, address the future context of parliament. So nothing that we are doing is permanent. So there is a certain kind of uh, uh, a deferral of the citizenship question that one sees in, in this debate. However, there is also a, a, a unanimity in terms or a consensus that is drawn through accommodation uh, in terms of what kind of citizenship are we presenting. So the uh, are we thinking of you know, in the Constituent Assembly? So there is, there is this anxiety over what ought to be the source of citizenship and what the, the provisions that are we are making, what kind of identity are those provisions going to communicate? You know, what kind of identity of, of for Indian citizenship are those provisions going to communicate? So amidst these, these anxieties, you know, there are people you know, who, who, who propose and, and and interestingly, the, 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 the amendment proposed by P.S. Deshmukh, you know, who was uh, 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 an activist against untouchability, a leader of the farmers movement, uh, who would later serve also in Nehru's cabinet, you know, for the, and also uh, would be a member of parliament from 1952 to 1962. Uh, and, and, uh, and, and he would serve as the agriculture minister and later as minister of uh, Corporation. Now, what he suggests is uh, that uh, no, we need to uh, uh, we need to uh, make uh, Indian citizenship. Uh, it's 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 necessary that we make Indian citizenship specific in a way that it does not become uh, you know, cheap uh, in, in or, or precariously flexible and cheap. So those those are the words he uses. Uh, to 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 ask uh, to to ask Ambedkar uh, to put in provisions that would specify that uh, the, those uh, people who would be Indian citizens, you know, if they belong to the 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 Hindu or the Sikh community, and uh, and and and, uh, and 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 also uh, provisions of uh, you know qualifying citizenship by birth. With provisions of being of uh, you no know, parentage of, uh, uh, of 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 Indian parents born of Indian parents, so there are proposals you no know, by people who are later going to serve as uh, as as uh, cabinet ministers in Nehru's parliament who are saying that you no know, let us not be uh, 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 diffident let us not be diffident and uh, uh, address the fact that there is no homeland for Hindus and therefore there needs to be. And, and he says that, no, uh, uh, let us not also be afraid uh, and uh, be dominated by, uh, by, by this, this, uh, uh, this category of secularism. And, and therefore what we need to do is to, to, to take care of things before you know, we are wiped out as a people. So, so that is a proposal that comes you know, from people like P.S. Deshmukh uh, and Katie Shah uh, supports him. Uh, but there is, no, there is no absolute fault line in this debate in terms of you know, when P.S. Deshmukh says that you know, let's identify citizenship also with parentage and also with religion. He is also saying that do not through Article 11 give you know, these uh, powers, extraordinary powers or, or, or powers to, to the parliament to change the citizenship law in, in future because that would amount to an amendment of the constitution. And, and he's also saying at the same time that, uh, you know, uh, 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 that returnees need to be considered, you know, those who've made, uh, who, who made the choice of be becoming, uh, of going to Pakistan and then they decided to return to India and therefore they are you no know, on permits, they need to be also because there is the idea that you no, know, they are of an Indian descent, they need to be also considered. So there is no, the, the point that I'm trying to say that you know, the, the, the fault lines in the, in the Constituent Assembly on you no know, what kind of identity would citizenship provisions propose are not absolute. And they are committed to a consensus that was made earlier, you know, when the drafting committee was constituted, that this is a pre-commitment that we have. 
And that pre-commitment was stated by Nehru towards the closing of the debates on citizenship. Now, where he says that, you know, you know the, the, the attack that was mounted on Ambedkar's proposal, you know, uh, uh, particularly uh, needs to be addressed by two things. And he says that one is what is the most practical way of addressing a situation that is you know, so complex and how can we address that situation with you know, what he says, meticulous care and also the, 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 the greatest amount of justice that can possibly be done it, at a time where, where things are so uh, traumatic. And he says that that is a principled decision that we must take. No, what is the greatest, greatest amount of justice that we can do in a situation which is so dynamic and so traumatic? And it is this idea of what is the principle on which we are going to uh, you know, think about this future of citizenship in India is something that Nehru emphasizes. You know? So whereas you know, uh, Ambedkar has already said in his proposals that what we are looking at is you know, uh, ad hoc provisions, the legislative powers lie with the future parliament and therefore Article 11, um, uh, Nehru is saying that's all well said, but we are what we are doing in the Constituent Assembly is that we are also putting down principles. And it is these principles that would continue to be the guiding force for future laws. And, and he, he identifies secularism as something you know, uh, which, which was being bandied about as a bad word in, uh, in the debate and says that, may I beg, and I'm reading out a quote from him, you know, uh, another word is thrown up a good deal, this secular state business. May I beg with all humility, those gentlemen who use this word often to consult some dictionary before they do it. It is brought in at every conceivable step and at every conceivable stage. I just do not understand it. It has a great deal of importance, no doubt, but it is brought in all contexts as if by saying that we are a secular state, we've done something amazingly generous given something out of our pocket to the rest of the world, something which we ought not have done, so on and so forth. We have only done something which every country does, except a few misguided and backward countries in the world. Let us not refer to that word in the sense that we have done something very mighty. So, so Nehru is clear that you know, what we are laying down here is principle. And you know, what you know, P.S. Deshmukh, despite you know, his uh, proposal, that there needs to be a religious identification of citizenship and the idea of a homeland uh, for Hindus and Sikhs, he, uh, uh, Deshmukh is also a diffident about giving the parliament overwhelming power. It says that, no, if, if the citizenship law is going to be amended, it is also to be borne in mind that it may be construed as an amendment of, of, of the constitution itself. So that is at the point of discussion. Now, when, and this is the last point I'll make and I'll stop in five minutes, when the past is being resurrected in the present, in the sight of deliberations in the parliament, no, the, 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 the idea of wrongs done during partition and, and the, 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 the presentation that the partition was done on the basis of religion, and therefore it is important, it is necessary, imperative that you know, the citizenship also must address that situation of, uh, you know, uh, of, of a religious-based identification of, of, uh, of citizens is something that is constantly being proposed. And the other thing about uh, the compet competence of, of the parliament as a legislative body is also being proposed. On the other hand, you know, there are those on the other side of the debate of this fault line are opposing uh, the act. And when they propose the act, they pull out the Nehruvian principle of constitutional secularism to say that, you know, and, and also to point out to the empirical, uh, uh, the flaws in the argument of, the, of those who are proposing the law to say, you no, know, how many, you no. Know, now, how many applications have you received? You now, pointing to the JPC report itself and the and 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 the the reports of the IB in the in uh, cited in the JPC report to say how many applications have we have you received? You now, how many people are there? You no, know, who would be brought under the purview of this act 
And, and whereas the claims are of lakhs and lakhs of people who would benefit from this act, the facts in the JPC report mention a few thousand only. And, and there is no clarity on why 31st December. So all of these things, but and the principles stand that there is no, there is a commitment, a pre-commitment to constitutional secularism. And that is the principle that should guide the future laws. So that is something that uh, the, the opposition is talking about. There is also another opposition, you know, and which is dispersed you know, across parties to, and, and it talks about, it talks about uh, the, the, the uh, to something, something uh, which one could perhaps say uh, it takes a citizen activist position and, 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 and it refers to and serves a warning to uh, the, by referring to the, the present democracies and their totalitarian past. So, and references made in particular to Germany in, in, and the fascist uh, uh, past of Germ history of Germany to, to draw uh, correspondence with you know, how the change in citizenship law may lead to uh, a, a kind of an understanding on aspersion that you know, India is moving towards that direction. So there is a strong, uh, there, is, there is an argument made to that in intent also, and an argument which says that you know, regardless of how the framing of the, or the, the way in which the debates in the parliament are structured, which is dominated by, which, which does not in any case follow the deliberative mode where a consensus based on agonism can be reached, but it is driven by the numbers and who has the majority. So regardless of what happens, the debates will move in the public space. And, 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 and these, these arguments draw from the, uh, the, the, the transformative discourse of the national movement, particularly the civil disobedience movement and how this movement will show up and is already showing up in, in, parts, in, in parts of the country. And also revolutionary patriotism of, uh, you know, the, the, uh, of, of revolutionaries in the past. So there are these different kinds of discourses that, is, that are, you know, uh, that are al arrayed in the space of the parliament. But one of the things that uh, that Chidambaram says, and this is something very interesting. And he says that no, what what we have done is you no know, as a collective, the parliamentarians have somehow you no know, uh, you know, given up their responsibility of making a law that stands constitutional scrutiny. So a, a lot of times, what is happening is that laws that are made in this circular building are ending up for scrutiny in another circular building close by. So he warns against that possibility. Why are we abdicating our responsibilities? And this would be a collective fault and, 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 and you know, opening up legislative powers to constant judicial scrutiny. And, and, and I think I'll end here and uh, I've, I've spoken too much and um, I would welcome comments, suggestions, questions, conversations. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am, for such an enlightening and uh, insightful lecture. It was immensely knowledgeable session. Uh, so we have a panel of students uh, who are going to ask questions first, and then we will open the floor for the others. So I would like to uh, invite Ashwarya to ask the question, please. Yes, ma'am. Um Good evening, ma'am. Uh, my question for you is that why are some Indians against the Citizenship Amendment Act 2019, even though it gave Indian citizenship to the ill-treated minorities from the neighboring countries? Okay, how many questions are, uh, why are some Indians against uh, the CAA 2019, uh, even when, uh, even when it protects minor perse persecuted uh, people. Okay, when it protects persecuted people. Okay, yeah, yeah. Uh, so how many such questions are there from the panel? Uh, one or two. One or then two. We, so, then we shall open for the audience. Yeah, yeah. 
so if can i have the second question from the panel too so that yeah, you know yeah. can organize uh, my uh, minute please chat box khol do uh, yes sir i have already opened it so uh, jyoti you can also ask your question yes ma'am good evening ma'am ma'am my question is that according to you are there according to you are there stateless people in india and what is their chance of getting citizenship in future okay thank you so much excellent questions uh, to ashwarya first why are some indians against the ca 2019 even when it protects persecuted people no uh, what i would say and this comes from my uh, reading of uh, you know um, those who opposed the caa uh, or criticized the caa and 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 the debates in the parliament you know where all these various arguments you know uh, were encapsulated in in that uh, in in opposition uh, people were not opposing uh, giving the protection of citizenship to people who had suffered persecution because of their religious identities no that was not the case none of the uh, mps in parliament opposing it said that uh, you know hindus sikhs jains buddhists you know from the the these countries should not be given protection they said when you give when you identify uh, people on the basis of religion a you are inserting a principle into citizenship which is alien to the to constitutional identity so that's one uh, a one kind of uh, argument that was being given and what they said therefore was to you no know, broaden the scope of even if you are to retain religion you no know, as uh, as a differentia uh for extending protection to a class of people you no know, identified by religion make religion an encompassing category you no know, include others who are similarly persecuted on the basis of religion and include also other categories other countries you no know, if you are uh, uh extending it to neighboring countries bring in other neighboring countries as well and you no know, give protection to people be, on on the basis of uh, religious persecution that would be a principled response to uh, uh, to to uh, to to a persecution and and interestingly uh, uh when the 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 law was being uh, uh, scrutinized by the joint parliamentary committee that went into the various provisions of the law uh, uh and and of course the joint parliament the, the task of the joint parliamentary committee was to uh, to recommend you no know, the uh, you know what was the strength of the provisions and uh, what kind of uh, changes ought to be made you now before the the bill is discussed in parliament and therefore it uh, you know uh, it just it it got into touch with and communicated with a whole range of what it called Uh, stakeholders and and some of these stakeholders were you no know, people from uh, gujarat rajasthan uh, assam and uh, meghalaya so they they went around talking to people and they also had consultations with okay just a second Indraji, there was a call from your phone, so which is why I picked up. Uh, and 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 they also um, consulted, you no, know, uh, different uh, ministries, governmental ministries, including uh, the Ministry of Law and Justice, particularly the Department of uh, 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 Legislate Legislation. And and it is important that uh, and also they exp- uh, they. a uh, consulted non official experts including those who were experts on constitutional matters so the experts on constitutional matters and this is all in the report of the jpc which is in the public domain so the experts on constitutional matters said that uh, you know the 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 bill uh, the the uh, if passed into an act with 
certainly invite scrutiny under Article 14 of the, the Constitution of India. And in order to buttress uh, the act against uh, any uh, 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 invalidation uh, on, on the count of being against Article 14 of the Constitution, uh, what uh, one could possibly do is to change the category in the act, which was the minority communities. So the act does not say religious minorities. No, it says minority communities and then goes on to identify minority communities on the basis of religion. And, 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 and the constitutional experts said, now, why not change it to persecuted minorities? Uh, uh, why not change this to persecuted minor uh, to to persecuted communities? Uh, but the the uh, the JPC is very clear uh, to because this is what the legislative department advises it that it is sufficiently buttressed against uh, uh, scrutiny under Article 14 of the Constitution because what it is doing is that it is making a uh, 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 you know, identifying a class of people you know, who are cl a clearly identifiable group. And there is a reasonable, there is a reason which is justifiable for making this differentiation. So the criteria of intelligibility and uh, reasonableness that you know, uh, they put forward for, uh, you know, uh, uh, for const constitutionality under Article 14 of the Act. Uh, and they also say that the uh, the the purpose of the act is to protect uh, extend protection to those suffering persecution on the basis of religion so there is a, a, a almost a stubborn streak within the jpc to say that we will not uh, enhance the, the 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 scope of this 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 category and therefore uh, what i would say that you know, those who are uh, opposing the act are not saying that you no know, these people should not get protection. They are saying they, they must get protection, but the law should not communicate in any way that uh, the, uh, the, uh, there is a preference for some uh, religions over others. So that is, uh, there is this, uh, 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 this kind of a debate within, uh, within the JPC and uh, and, and it resonates also in the, uh, in the, in the space of the parliament. Uh, are there stateless people in India? Uh, there are people who can potentially become stateless. No, say, for example, no, if the detainees under NRC, uh, there is a possibility that they could become stateless. There, is, there are stateless people like uh, the Rohingyas you know, who are in India and, and the NHRC has no, uh, has has asked the state to give uh, protection to uh, it, uh, the the Supreme Court and the and the NHRC also have uh, asked for protection for the NHRC uh, for the Rohingyas. Uh, so the the category that you are talking about is a category different from illegal migrants. No, it's it's not an um, a, a group of people who who are uh, pers who are legally illegal migrants. They are a group of people that come under the convention, international conventions of protection. So the refugees and the stateless persons and the displaced persons come under that category. And, and the, 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 the possibility of them getting or not getting uh, citizenship is a long drawn uh, kind of a, uh, of, a, of, a, uh, of a process and also depends upon the kind of policies that the, the, the government evolves. In the case of illegal migrants, and this is something that we need to keep in mind. No, the, there is, there are standard operating procedures already in place 2011 onwards, no, which allow for people who have fled to India because of religious per persecution from neighboring countries to acquire citizenship. And the, the, these procedures empower the local district administration, and you no, know, you would have uh, read in newspapers, you no, know, uh, the the Sindhi refugees getting citizenship in Rajasthan, 
or district administration being empowered in MP and other states to give citizenship to people who have applied you know, under these operating procedures in, uh, which were put in place in 2011 and Gujarat, of course. So, so there are these bureaucratic procedures available. So the question therefore is, you know, why uh, make a change in the law itself when the bureaucracy is equipped to do that at the district level uh, because of the, the procedures that are already in place. So that's where I would leave that question. Uh, Pooja, uh, ma'am, please tell, they are, they are saying that CA will affect Muslim minorities. Is that true? Uh, Mandeep says, ma'am, the debate for CA, for instance, in the mainstream has been about secularism or inclusivity. But in Northeast, and particularly Assam, added to this debate is the question of indigeneity. How do we reconcile these competing concerns of inclusivity and indigeneity? Why Muslims have been excluded from CAA? Ma'am, opposition parties in India refer to the bill as unconstitutional. Uh, Ma'am, is it true? Yeah. So, so I think um, uh, uh, to Shubham and to Pooja, I would respond uh, together. No? So, so where... Uh, so one one way in which I can respond to it is the the argument about principles and uh, constitutional secularism as a pre-commitment, uh, which was discussed, which has been discussed in different places in the Constitution of India. So there is that component of uh, you know uh, of 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 what kind of citizens we are. Uh, which, which is pretty much there in the constitution, particularly in the debates on citizenship. Uh, so uh, when, when religion is, is construed as an identifier, as specific conditions that would make some candidates, preferred candidates for citizenship, when there, are, would, there would be so many others would be in common circumstances is something that is seen as among those who say that it is unconstitutional as going against the spirit of the constitution, the principles that Nehru uh, talked about in the constituent assembly. There are also uh, legal grounds on which the constitutionality of, this, of, of the uh, CAA has been uh, questioned. And if you were to read the affidavits that have been uh, uh, that have been submitted to the Supreme Court, 144 affidavits had been uh, before uh, the lockdown and immediately after uh, the passage of the Act, almost 144 affidavits against the CAA had been submitted to the Supreme Court, and the Ministry of Home Affairs had had uh, had responded to what it called a preliminary provisional counter affidavit, you know, is in response in particular to the affidavit that was submitted by the, uh, the, the Indian Un uh, Union Muslim League, the IUML. Uh, and and, and the, the affidavits which have questioned the constitutionality of citizenship uh, have said that you know, the, the of, of Citizenship Act, CAA 2019, have said that you know, it goes against the right to equality provisions in the Indian constitution. Now, those of us here who are students of political science and even otherwise, if you go and read Article 14 of the Indian Constitution, you know, it has been guaranteed to citizens and persons. So it, it, is, it is a guarantee that is available to everybody. Uh, it is a guarantee that protects you know, against discrimination, equality before the law, and against arbitrary action of the state, no equal protection of the law. So there are two, pro two parts, components of this act, equality before the law and equal protection of the law. Now, uh, and again, I will, oh, my, let me open the chat again. I will um, uh, go back to uh, the, the, uh, the, the debates in the parliament and, and also uh, some of the arguments that came up in the JPC uh, to say why, how Article 14 is being used by people on both sides of the of 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 the contest. So, um, so those in favor of the of 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 CA would say that no, it is about 
no protection of persons and article 14 is not violated because of the way in which article 14 has been interpreted in specific cases by the supreme court and the case in question that has been referred to is the uh, is is the anwar ali case in 1952 uh, which was a case uh, in west bengal uh, which the west bengal government incidentally lost you know, uh, of uh, of of people who could be persecuted for certain offenses you know, by uh, special courts and uh, and and what the supreme court said that you no know, the 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 it if if a particular law addresses a specific set of people and there can be different kinds of laws that address specific classes of people you no know, there could be uh, people identified by class a caste people identified by gender but you no know, there should be in law a clearly uh, a, a, a clear grounds on which this identification is made so that this group of people because of their common attributes can stand out separate from other groups of people you know, who would have different identifiers and then it says that the law in its objectives should clearly state out the reason for having such a law and the reason for classifying some people together as subjects of law should correspond to the objectives of the law so long as there is a correspondence between the two the law would be constitutional and so this is the argument that is put by those in favor of article of, of the ca to say that there is in this case a clearly identified group you no know, people belonging to these religions who have suffered persecution because they belong to this religion and the objective of the law is to give them protection however in the anwar ali law anwar ali case itself the supreme court went on to say that uh, in uh, what should also be scrutinized is that the object the 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 what should also be scrutinized is the reasonableness of uh, the objective in order to 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 see whether uh, in order to to give protection against arbitrary action of the state so it's not just anti discrimination that needs to that is the concern of law and that's what the courts would scrutinize, but also whether or not the objective itself is arbitrary, you no, know, and 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 whether there is uh, some arbitrariness in in terms of uh, 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 laying down the objectives of the act itself. So, so there is this different argument that also emerges in Anwar Ali Sarkar, and that is affirmed in the Nas Foundation judgment to say that the objectives of all acts should also be subject to judicial scrutiny, just to say that the act has this objective doesn't actually make the act reasonable. So, so there are these other arguments. Why have Muslims been excluded from CAA? You know, so there, that, is, that is the entire argument. You know? The exclusion you know, from, this, from the CAA is, 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 is symbolic as well as emphatic. You know, how would how would that stand in the constituent assembly debate that we were talking about? The idea that there is a homeland you know, to which people who belong to this, to this group by blood can return. Uh, and and, 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 and this, this separation distinguishability can be made emphatic by laying it down in law that you know, the, these are the people who have a right to return. And therefore, you know, emphasizing that partition was about no uh, 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 religion, and it was about you no know, building a common identity, which would be a Hindu identity, and encompass the, those religions that emerged out of the soil of, the, of this country, etc. So the 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 and, and the decision, however, in in terms of you no know, the kind of identity, you no know, that the law itself is producing, you know, of who uh, who can be extended protection, and therefore the idea of return to homeland is 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 about the 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 facts of partition itself okay so uh we uh where two brothers meet after what one Indian, one remains sick but pakistan one has to change his religion because of fear. yeah so so precisely this is the point and this is what nehru was referring to no what we need to do is to have that 
and, and if if you if you recall the just to destiny speech by nehru you know, where uh nehru is saying that you know what we are stepping out of the old into the new and india you know ancient and eternal would collectively you know all indians would, would step into this what he calls new without fear so this is this is what i'm trying to you know push at you no know, uh, the idea of india is an idea of uh, a country where people can live without fear and and religion must not and cannot be the basis of uh, making distinctions between people and it cannot and must not be the basis of instilling fear in people and therefore nehru is say, saying that you no know, secularism is something that is pro professed by you no know, all countries that call themselves democratic except those that are not wedded to principles of constitutionalism and some backward countries etc we don't want to be like them so that is precisely the point nobody should have fear that is what a constitutional democracy ought to be and this is how i would respond to that question can we okay. say let's step forward to make india a hindu nation yeah i think i've already responded yeah i i think uh, uh, we have to stop here because you know it's a very complicated hmm. subject so subject we can keep on going yeah so so we have to stop somewhere okay. so i i uh, i just uh, would like to say if some some faculty member wants to ask something uh, any faculty yeah yeah uh, can i Sangeeta, yeah, hi, you can. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you, thank you, Indrajit, and uh, hi, hi, Sangeeta. Hi. hi, it's a pleasure to hear Anupama. Uh, you know, her scholarly debates on the citizenship on the topic. Not only I refer to your scholarly work on citizenship to my students, but also I have been keenly listening to you today, and you know the three important sites that you've discussed, and. Uh, also it's been very interactive very engaging and i'm very happy to see the students response also so i wanted to ask a question but then i was you know because of the different uh, level of engagement with the students have with you i mean i'm really happy to see that you were able to evoke that kind of you know uh, response from the students and i've also cleared many of their doubts but to my mind if i feel you know that uh, from uh, to give a different perspective to the to this that uh, it's uh, how to reconcile uh, uh, reconcile this idea of you know the the interest of the state with the democratic rights of the citizens like for instance you know where uh, we have where the state is facing many challenges many there is many, there are many challenges to the internal security of the state with regard to you know not only the cyber threats but also to the emergence of various non state uh, actors uh, you know extraterritorial non state actors so how uh, i mean uh, the citizens they, <coughs> they can exercise their rights only in a congenial enabling environment so how does the state uh, how is how does it reconcile to to these challenges yeah. thank you for that challenges. question so can, can we can we take one one yeah, one or two yeah. or more more questions so that we can uh, respond uh, yeah. to all the questions together anybody else so anybody? i would like to ask a question if you permit yeah yeah uh, please introduce yourself yes sir a uh, good evening ma'am good evening sir uh, this is manaswi bangad from ramlal anand college university of delhi my okay. question is a ball of question i will say it is not a single question it's a ball of question which definitely comes to citizenship uh, please end. please be brief I, I because we have been we have been we have been sir, uh, I will try. she I has been talking for a long time yeah sir i just take a minute or two yes uh mama when we see that uh, the government is proposing the bill to link the voter id card with the aadhar card uh, as we uh, are concerned that voting uh, voting right is with the indian citizens only so isn't a kind of a indirect providing the citizenship to the people because aadhar card is with everyone and they can be fakely made the voting voter id card and aadhar card so if we are providing the uh, if we are linking voter id card with aadhar card so isn't we providing indirectly the citizenship to all the people 
good. And the question concerned is, uh, then why CA-19 has been a mockery or a drama from the side of the government if it has to link the voter ID card with the Aadhaar card? Because that seems very uh, disturbing on the part of the government. Is it trying to divert the issues and the attention of the citizens from the uh, basic issues to the mockery and in the front of the gov uh, people just fla flaunting their thing? So how you conceive it in regard to the citizenship? Thank you, ma'am. Uh, Inderjit, uh, may yeah, I? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah you, can we yeah. can we take the third one also? Yeah, uh, Inderjit. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, Bor, uh, yes. Mandeep Bora's question. Yeah, yeah. Uh, may, um, mine is not a question, but a small comment here. Actually, uh, thanks a lot for making. Uh, I thank Professor uh, Anupama for making such a difficult thing very easy for us and our students. Actually, I teach constitutional democracy to first year student, and this is the best way you have given the concept, clarity of the concept, and the volume of work has been made so much easy for us, not for me, but for my all students. So thank you, Inderjit, for giving me this opportunity, and thank you, Professor Anupma, for making things very easy for us to understand. I know that... Uh, uh, I know that we can go long and long, long. Yeah. We cannot address all the questions in just one seminar or webinar. For that, we need volume of seminars. But I appreciate all the efforts here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Vipin. Thank you for being here. Uh, yeah, ma'am. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Vipin, for your, uh, for your uh, appreciation. Um, okay, so so let me uh, go to Sangeeta's question. It's extremely important, you know. Uh, the the and 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 this is something that comes up also in in the debates on citizenship. You know, uh, the if if uh, uh, if if one looks at the the uh, the trajectory of uh, citizenship in Assam in particular, and uh, uh, the 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 IMDT Act and its scrapping in two thousand five by the uh, by the Supreme Court, uh, one of the things that the Supreme Court said while scrapping the act of, uh, is that uh, no, apart from the fact that you know, if uh, Sarbanan Sonawal was the the primary petitioner, you no, know, uh, uh, again asking for the repeal of the act, and uh, you no, know, he he repealed in in on on grounds of uh, you know the additional burden that uh, you know this put on um, on 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 on. Uh, the act being applied only in the context of Assam as discriminatory and the kind of anxieties and uh, uh, and and uh, an alienation that the act produced in various spheres of life. Uh, when the Supreme Court uh, decided, you know, five uh, uh, five years after uh, Sonawal petitioned, uh, the Supreme Court uh, increased the scope of the act not just to cover Assam but the entire country. And one of the reasons that it did that was to say that uh, you no, know, it mm, illegal migration into India was not something that was uh, only an Assamese anxiety. You no, know? it was an anxiety for the entire country because of the threat that illegal migrants posed to the country, you know, to the security of the country, and therefore illegal immigration was. Uh, presented as an act of aggression. No, it wasn't just land hungry peasants. No, which no, which the judgment also cited, but also the uh, what it said was the continuing flow into Assam and from Assam into uh, the rest of the country of people who were potentially dangerous. And and therefore, if 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 you look at that context of two thousand three to two thousand five. Uh, you see that uh, the the uh, and, and the depositions that were made to the JPC that went into the the uh, the desirability of the 2003 amendment, particularly the preparation of the National Register of Citizens. There are a whole range of depositions which talk about you know, the the pros and cons of preparing a register. You no, know, the, the 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 idea that you no know, uh, how uh, you know the the illegal migrants who are a threat uh, to the country would you know, subsequently be able to perhaps register, etc. So the idea of national security is something that is also woven into the preparation of the NRC and the, uh, and the, and the, uh, the 2003 amendment is also a manifestation of that uh, context of uh, national security state. 
the assam samlita samiti the 2014-15 judgment which you know which uh, led to the supreme court monitor preparation of nrc uh, in assam uh, took that argument forward to to say that uh, uh you know what does article 355 mean you no know, that needs to be you no know, put to constitutional adjudication you no know, by the court so is it just the territory or it's also the people that need to be protected and therefore as soon as one says people need to be protected there is again through the nrc the creation of that wall of separation between those who are you no know, uh, legal citizens and those who are you no know, impersonators strangers among us who could be potential threat to our not just territorial security but the security of the people so there are these you no know, irreconcilable you no know, uh, uh, fault lines you no know, of liberty and security and mm-hmm. and and the 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 discourse of on security you no know, official discourse on security has invariably led to an exponential rise in the powers of the executive and and through a range of laws that apply to the the various parts of the northeast etc no are a manifestation of the national security state syndrome and which is of course something that is related to the 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 question of citizenship as well so it's in in the in the debates on rohingyas for example the the the, the question of of security and rohingyas being threat to security also becomes no one of uh, of of the arguments to deny you no know, any kind of protection to to rohingyas etc so this is a continuing debate and yeah. largely unconcilable yeah. so yes. so that is something that we need and, to keep uh, thinking about yeah just yeah. to add to that anupama it's no longer restricted to assam it's also yeah. infiltrated into uh, odisha also because yeah. this this issue is now a python around the neck of the bureaucrats too the law makers yeah. the policy makers yeah. so yeah. Uh, so yeah. yeah thank you thank you yeah. for addressing so that's that's a, a dilemma that you know yeah. and, and invariably the state decides you no know, government decides in 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 towards veers towards security and 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 that's that's where much of uh, uh, mansvi's uh, question about voter id and aadhar card yes aadhar card is uh, for uh, residents and it's not uh, for citizens and and the the objective in the you know electoral law reform Uh, act you no know, which was passed recently uh, to link uh, the aadhar card with the voter id with the electoral roll you know according to the justification given in the objectives of the act was to say that you no know, there is the, the electoral roll is need to be purified it needs to be weeded out of duplication so that that's the justification in the objectives and to weed out you no know, those who are non citizens it is imperative that you know the government is able to distinguish between citizens and non citizens who are these the the linking with aadhar does not mean that everybody who is who has an aadhar card would be an in uh, would be getting uh, the the uh, would would be on the electoral roll too the idea it appears is to use the linkage with aadhar to weed out those who are not citizens so the the to to and which is what aadhar was no uh, uh supposed to do but in the context of uh, uh welfare pol- welfare of welfare of the state recipients of welfare of the state uh to to enable the state to ensure that those who are receiving ensure welfare that those who are receiving welfare i can hear myself uh are, are, are those who are uh, uh entitled to be getting it so in some senses it reduces normatively uh, uh voting to uh, to uh, voters to recipient of welfare no if you link aadhar with uh, with uh, with the, the electoral roll so that is a normative criticism and of course there are other criticisms that you know one can go into uh, 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 saying that this is another exercise of enumeration that the state nece- unnecessarily gets into and there is a whole range of issues of privacy that are also associated with uh, with with the linking of electoral roll with aadhar and making vul- voters vulnerable because their identity would be open to third parties as well so there are a whole range of uh, uh, issues associated with uh, the linking of electoral rolls with aadhar uh, the question from uh, the, uh, by mondi bora in assam it's a extremely complex situation and 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 interestingly uh, the the entire question of indigeneity not just 
and 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 uh, Mondi would know this better than uh, than me. Uh, entire question of indigeneity is not only with relationship with relation to uh, the 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 CA and the NRC, but uh, but talking but thinking about you know what uh, what is an Assamese identity. So, uh, and I'm thinking about the, the, the entire pushing of uh, you know, the, the provision in the Assam Accord, which talks about constitutional, pro uh, which talks about protection, preservation, and promotion of cultural, religious, linguistic identity of the Assamese people, you know, of the several provisions of the Assam Accord. This is one provision that, that is being pushed forward. And in, in that context, if one was to look at the entire history of uh, no, uh, debating Assamese identity, no, within the cabinet subcommittee that was set up by Tarun Gogoi in 2011, or the different subcommittees that were set up in the context of the CA 2019 by the, 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 the present regime. And, and the, 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 the uh, section six committee, I think, uh, it's 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 called which which go which is going into the uh, which has submitted its report on the question of the preservation of uh, Assamese identity and the question of indigeneity then becomes an important question in in that framework and 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 I I I I, I think you know, it's always it's also being raised in the context of uh, different forms of representation different forms of entitlement including reservation or making distinctions between no uh, uh, immigrants uh, that have come over a period of time from different parts of uh, of of uh, of India and also claim a, an identity which is you no know, an Adivasi tri uh, tribal identity but are not indigenous to the land of uh, of Assam. So so there are these complex issues that are associated with the question of indigeneity in Assam, and that's the the. Uh, uh, that's all I can say uh, uh, to your question, Mondeep. Uh, Indrajit, I'm done. Okay, thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, I would now like to invite Gayatri to please give the vote of thanks. Good evening, everyone. It has been such an honor to be a part of this wonderful event. On behalf of the Political Science Department of Sri Guru Nanak Dev Khalsa College, I would like to extend my heartfelt gratitude to our esteemed guest, Professor Anupama Roy. Ma'am, your thoughts on citizenship has truly inspired us. We have gained a better perspective and a deeper insight on all these topics. A sincere thanks to the head of the department, Dr. Indrajit Singh, for his initiative and for providing us with this opportunity. I would also like to thank our principal, Dr. Gurmohinder Singh, for granting permission for this webinar. The efforts of the organizing team and staff members have been remarkable. Finally, I appreciate all of you present here for making time to be with us today and helping in making this webinar a grand success. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gayatri. Thank you very much, everybody, political science department and the college and uh, Dr. Indrajit. Thank you very much. I shall take my leave now. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you. Bye bye. I would like to request everyone to please fill the feedback form and then leave this meeting. So thank you, Department of Paul Science, Khalsa College. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you. Welcome, welcome.
Um, you can stop the recording now.